So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first of our Brain Health webinars. I can see people are just logging on, so you're all very welcome this morning, and happy Brain Awareness Week. There's a lot of uh, brain-related activities and events going on this week, so uh, this is probably just one of many that people are getting involved in. Uh, so my name is Carol Rogan, and I coordinate Dementia Research Network Ireland. Uh, so we're a collaboration of academics, clinicians, charity sector partners and people living with dementia and Parkinson's disease. Um, and I'm joined today by Sinead Grennan, who's one of our members, and she's going to say hello there. Hi, Sinead. Hi, how are you? Good. And uh, Sinead is, uh, works in Engaging Dementia, which some people might know of that organisation. And Sinead is one of our members and she's going to help out uh, in the background, if you like, uh, making sure that everything runs smoothly and answering your questions and making sure all the technical things work for us today. Um, so some housekeeping rules. Um, we're going to be recording the webinar, so it's going to be available on our YouTube channel, uh, hopefully later today or if not tomorrow. And feel free to let people know about the recording. Uh, so people's names won't appear, it'll be anonymous, you'll just hear and see uh, the speakers, uh, so nobody's names will appear in the recording and any questions that people ask, uh, they, you know, it'll all be anonymous. Uh, feel free to use, uh, there's a chat and a Q&A button, uh, for those of you who are more familiar with Zoom, I'm sure you've used them before, but maybe for some people who haven't used them, they're down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so you can use either of them to type in questions or comments as we go through the presentations. Uh, so we'll address any questions at the end. Uh, we're going to have three speakers talking for about 10 minutes each. And then at the end of that, we'll, we'll address any of your questions or comments. And we also have a 20 minute um, Q&A uh, session uh, built in at the end. So hopefully we'll have, we'll have time to, to address any of the questions that you may have. Uh, so, as I said, we have three speakers from Tallaght University Hospital, and I'm going to hand you over now to our first speaker, who's Professor Sean Kennelly, a consultant geriatrician uh, at Tallaght University Hospital, and he's also director of the Memory Assessment and Support Service at Tallaght Hospital. Uh, Sean is also the chair of our network. So, over to you, Sean. Uh, good morning, Carl, and uh, good morning, everybody, uh, and, and thank you for joining us this morning. It's a uh, you know, great to have the opportunity to talk about brain health and in reality this is a concept that we wouldn't have even you know been discussing um a decade ago and and the potential for us to prevent uh many of the conditions that can affect our brain as as we age and it's you know phenomenal that uh drni uh, the dementia research network of ireland are able to pull together this you know clinical academic and advocacy expert uh, expertise to uh, present some of these um you know kind of findings and how the new evidence is, is coming online all the time about uh, strategies that we can employ as individuals to protect our brain. And I'm going to be talking today with uh, Tim Ducla, who's a specialist registrar in our memory assessment service in Tally University Hospital, and uh, Joshi Dukey, who's uh, one of our advanced nurse practitioners uh, working in that memory service. And what we're really going to try and capture today is a snapshot of some of the basics with regards to what is dementia, um, some of the terminology that we use around dementia, and and uh, if you like the emerging evidence over the last few years that really does highlight that uh, much of dementia is preventable. And also then the approach that we take within our own memory service uh, in the development of a personal prevention plan or a personal approach towards trying to make sure your brain has the best opportunity to age well over the, the, the following two or three decades. So hopefully uh, the slides will move on. One of the other things we've learned with uh, Zoom over the last few months is how often it lets us down. So just to, to start off is to really kind of give a snapshot. And these are this is information which has largely been uh, gleaned and, and retrieved from the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. It's about 64,000 people currently living in Ireland with dementia. About 63% uh, or almost two thirds of those are living within their own community. And I think it's important to say because oftentimes where people hear the, the word dementia, they have this automatic assumption um, of, of 
you know people with very significant symptoms but many of the people that we would still see would, would we would see in our clinical service are still working um, and are still living a very active uh, life with very active social life and very active uh, occupational life so the majority of people who are living with dementia in Ireland are, are living in their own communities and of course the big issue around dementia is that age is the main risk factor as we grow older there is a greater likelihood of, of us developing dementia. And it's not that it's age per se, other than it is conditions which affect the brain as we grow older are, are more likely to, to cause it. And with the, with the good news and the tremendous success that is our aging dividend, with more people living into later life, um, of course, that does have the, the, the flip side of you know, a greater need to be focused on preventing age-related illness so that we're not just increasing lifespan as in the length of time that people are living, but that we're also increasing health span. So as in how well people are as they live older. Uh, and dementia as a single condition is, is, is perhaps the most expensive condition that we treat with almost 1.7 billion um, going towards the annual cost. And that was uh, research done by Suzanne Cahill and, and Eamon O'Shea. But when you look at that kind of spread, it's really essential that we develop better preventative, diagnostic, therapeutic and social care solutions for people who are living with dementia and the people who support their care within communities. It really is of paramount importance. And that's why the, the G20, the WHO and all of these global um, healthcare uh, and, and economic agencies have you know, finding treatments and interventions for dementia as their number one priority over the next decade. But what do we mean by dementia? Um, dementia really is a memory or thinking difficulty which causes impairment in our ability to do our day-to-day -day activities. It's an umbrella term uh, in, in that it's not a diagnosis within its own right. It doesn't actually say what is causing that difficulty. And you know, the what we would always stress is that it's a bit like saying somebody is breathless. It doesn't tell you whether it's their heart or their lungs or some other factor that might be causing their breathlessness. It doesn't tell you, you know, the, the factors that similarly dementia is kind of a general term to say that somebody's memory or thinking isn't as good and that it's interfering with their their day to day uh, ability to perform their tasks. When people come into the memory service, they're often very focused around the memory tests and things like that that we do. And actually, one of the key messages we would give them is the diagnosis of dementia isn't made on the basis of how you perform on these memory tests. It isn't made on the basis of, of whether you're, you're scoring very high or scoring very low. Uh, a diagnosis of dementia is, is on the basis of us clearly identifying from either yourself subjectively or a somebody who's living alongside you uh, subjectively or objective evidence that we find of you having functional loss as a result of that memory loss. So it's about the inability to do things is what's important when we're diagnosing dementia, not just scores on a memory test. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. And I would say the most common question I get asked within the clinic, especially around the time of disclosure, is what's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Well, Alzheimer's disease is caused by two proteins called amyloid and tau that build up in the brain. And as a result of the buildup of those proteins in the brain, uh, people develop the memory difficulty. So if you like, Alzheimer's is what causes those symptoms of dementia. But other causes of dementia are stroke or what's sometimes called vascular disease or blood vessel related disease. There's Parkinson's related dementia. Um, there's a thing called frontotemporal dementia. And there's about a hundred various different causes of dementia from, from the point of view of autoimmune causes to infections and other neurodegenerative. And by neurodegenerative, we mean processes that, that uh, cause uh, cells within the brain to progressively uh, deteriorate. And what we understand, and I suppose what's become far more clear over the last decade, we've made huge progress in understanding what is underlying these different causes of dementia. So for example, I've mentioned Alzheimer's disease, which accounts for about 70%. It's caused by the accumulation of the toxic proteins of amyloid and tau. Um, and we know that all of these other dementias are also caused by these toxic accumulations of different proteins. So if you like non-Alzheimer's disease, neurodegenerative um, uh, dementias would probably account for around 15%. And those are things like frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, which people will have heard of, and things like progressive supernuclear palsy, and even motor neuron disease down here. So around 15% of those, but those are all caused by these proteins 
which accumulate within the brain in an abnormal fashion. And for these kinds of, of conditions and these kinds of neurodegenerative uh, dementias, this is where most of our emerging drugs are really looking to target the accumulation of these proteins. And sometimes it's that we have a genetic defect that causes us to produce too much of them. Or sometimes it's just that as we get older, the mechanisms for cleaning these proteins from the brain just are less efficient. And as a result, as we get older, they accumulate in the brain. So in a younger brain, we're far more efficient at removing these proteins and stopping them accumulating. Uh, whereas as we get older, we're just not as good as, 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 as uh, removing them from the brain. And of course, the other big uh, mechanism by which dementia can be caused and often will be found coexisting with these other proteins that develop is vascular. And this is uh, where uh, we have a blood vessels or little strokes or little bleeds in the brain in, in key areas that are responsible for memory. And we often call that vascular dementia. And one of the, one of the real important messages that we're aware of over the last uh, you know, decade or, or two decades even, is that the most important organ for a healthy brain is a healthy heart. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we're talking about um, the, those lifestyle risk factors that we can modify. And vascular dementia is involved in at least 15 to 20% of all, all causes of dementia. So a very common co occurrence. And this is, this is what I would see on an MRI scan of somebody who has vascular dementia. So typically this would be, you know, healthy brain tissue would be gray, uh, gray and all of this white matter here is, is after accumulating and it's as a result of little strokes or little bleeds uh, in, in this brain tissue. I also, and it's a little bit of a reductive statement, but I often say the brain is like a fuse board. So we have our key lobe. So we have our frontal lobe, which is probably the most important um, part of the brain. And it's responsible for not just our motor sy system. So how we move and coordinating and, and, and uh, you know, strategizing how we move, but also responsible for behavior and also responsible for short-term memory and speech production, if you like. So the motor of speech. We have our temporal lobe, which is often where our main memory centers are stored. Uh, so our hippocampus is, is one of those key uh, memory centers within the brain, but it's also a language production area. We have our occipital lobe, which is almost exclusively to, you know, responsible for looking at vision and sight. And we have our uh, parietal lobe, which is our main sensory lobe. So uh, how we, how we uh, you know, sense touch, warm, cold, different temperatures, pain, stimuli, and those kind of things will often left, right orientation. Those, those kind of features will be in our parietal lobe. Now, while it's nice to kind of try and, and, and distinguish these lobes into these discrete functions, of course, it's far more complicated in that there are loads of interconnecting pathways between these different lobes to complete different cognitive function. But depending on what part of the brain is affected, and oftentimes another common question I'll get in the clinic is, you well, you know, my mother or my father or my, my brother or my sister, they had dementia and this isn't what happened with them. They didn't have this symptom that I have. Well, depending on what part of the brain is most affected by these proteins accumulating, well, you can have symptoms of memory loss, of, of you know, diminished ability to make an accurate judgment relative to what you would have done before, misplacing things, reduced language skills, personality changes, maybe sometimes hallucinations or inappropriate behavior. So the symptoms that you can get are as a reflection of what type of protein is accumulating, but also where that protein preferentially accumulates in the brain, and particularly in early stages. As a dementia evolves or as, as somebody lives with dementia for a little bit longer, oftentimes they may have some features of, of many of these symptoms. One of the other things that's happened over the last few years is the development of biomarkers and especially for Alzheimer's disease, which are really now part of, of clinical practice. And this is where we're able to measure some of these proteins either within the fluid that we're able to get from a thing called a CSF or a lumbar puncture, which is a, a little needle into the lower back where we retrieve a little bit of what we call spinal fluid and we're able to measure these proteins that circulate around the brain and, and say with high accuracy whether or not somebody has Alzheimer's disease or not. Or similarly, the, the onset of these new scans which are, have special uh, radioactive tracers that are able to stick to the protein amyloid, which we know is the main protein associated with Alzheimer's disease. And we're able to tell very accurately now 
whether or not somebody has these proteins and has this, if you like, what we call pathological or disease classification of Alzheimer's disease, rather than just having to depend on the symptoms that we would have been seeing before um, and try to make our best judgment on the basis of symptoms. So similar to where, you know, if, if somebody had a, a cancer and they had a biopsy, there was a very clear and accurate diagnosis. For Alzheimer's disease now, we're able to also make a very clear and accurate diagnosis by identifying these, these molecules. And what we know is these molecules can be evident in the brain 15 to 25 years before you have any clinical symptoms, before you have any signs or symptoms of memory loss. And the great hope is that that gives us a really good window to intervene, to reduce your risk of developing dementia. And I suppose, where do we get that confidence from? Well, we know that this is a, this is a very interesting paper from about 2015, and I won't you know, go into too much detail on it, other than what it did was it measured the amount of people, or it measured, measured the amount of these proteins, these, if you like, toxic proteins in the brains of people who are the age of 90. And what we found that almost half of people have these proteins at the age of 90, but many of them do not have any dementia. So only about half of those people, again, had dementia. So half the people who had enough protein that they should have cognitive symptoms by everything that we would have known beforehand actually didn't. So something was protecting the brains of half of these people who, despite having this protein accumulation, didn't have clinical symptoms of dementia at the age of 90. So this has kind of really led to the, you know, a, a very you know, deep focus as what accounts for this difference between this group of people who have as much, much of these toxic proteins as many people who have clinical symptoms of dementia, but do not have the same cognitive symptoms and do not have the same uh, memory issues as them. And some of the things are what we call cognitive reserve. And some of this comes from uh, our, you know, how long we've been in school and the types of jobs we've done, different factors that feed into it, but almost certainly what, one of the things we focused on over the last decade or so in particular is where lifestyle feeds into this and what accounts for this. And, and, and further, if you like, confidence that we're on the right track, that something is happening uh, and that our brains are different now to what they were 40 years ago because of these changes and things like education comes from, this is a cohort of people, a very well-described medical cohort of people, a group of people in, in Boston, in the United States that have been followed over many, many years to look at trends um, for, for heart disease and other chronic disease conditions. And in, in following this group of people, what we've found is that there has been a real age adjusted reduction in the risk of getting dementia. So 40 years ago, uh, you were more, you were 40% more likely to develop dementia at a given age uh, and, 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 and than you are now. So there has been a reduction you know, for somebody who's in their 80s, there is almost a 40% reduction in the likelihood that they will develop dementia. Now, some of that is counteracted by the fact that we have so many more people who are now living to 80 than we did 40 years ago. So that the, the actual numbers of people who may develop dementia are still going to exponentially increase, but not as much as they would have done, you know, had, this, had, had, had they been aging 40 years ago. So we've seen this age adjusted reduction in the risk of developing dementia. And very similar have been reported in registers in the United Kingdom, Sweden, Netherlands, and Germany. And we really do feel very strongly that a lot of this reduction in the risk of developing dementia is due to what we call better vascular risk treatment. So better treatments for blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes, which means that the brain has a better chance to successfully age and less vascular disease. So I'm not going to, Dr. Duclo is going to talk a little bit more about how we, you know, if we target certain modifiable risks, there is the potential for us to prevent 40%. And this is from a Lancet Commission. It's probably the higher, highest order of evidence we can have in medicine to make any statement where they, they, they go through all of the existing literature on, on, a, on an issue and on a condition. And, and Jill Livingston and colleagues in, in uh, July 2020 this year published this paper, which really broke down these risk factors and the proportion of benefit that we can get from targeting them. And it's really about a life course by targeting these risk factors all the way from early life where education um, is, is a risk factor to midlife into later life and knowing which risk factors are most pertinent to address at different stages of life. 
within our own memory assessment service here in, in, in Tala Hospital, which includes our, our primary geriatric medicine clinic, as well as our memory assessment service uh, and our clinic for seeing people who might have behavioral symptoms related to their dementia, we've developed a raft of post-diagnostic services. Uh, and and in, you know, as part of these post-diagnostic services, we've developed a brain health clinic, which Joshi will talk about, and the, uh, both Cathy and Joshi, the advanced nurse practitioners in the clinic really run that. And this is up here as well, where um, we also, uh, uh, the site for the National Intellectual Disability Memory Service, which we do with colleagues from Trinity in particular, uh, Mary McCarran and, and, and Janet Tyrrell, my psychiatry uh, colleague. And of course, brain health is incredibly important in, in uh, that population as well, who have a genetically uh, great heightened risk of developing um, uh, Alzheimer's disease in particular. And this is just a, a bit of a sign off. There is many, many people involved in our memory service and many different disciplines from other clinicians to uh, psychologists, occupational therapists and, and, other, uh, and other doctors and our speech and language therapists as well. So I'm going to sign off and let Tim uh, take over. So I'm going to stop sharing now and you can take on there, Jim. That's great. I think Thank we're going to do questions at the end, Carol, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So there's a few questions coming in. We can address them after the three speakers. Yeah. So, uh, Tim, you're still on mute. Um, your slide just a minute yep. ago, it, it did go into presentation mode there. So if you go back into what you were doing a minute ago and my, I'll let you know. My apologies, Carol. Can you hear me there now? Yeah, can hear you. Yeah, loud and clear. I'm just trying to get the slides into the proper format. Lovely. Brilliant. Yeah, so, um, that looks good now. Thanks so much, Sean. Sorry again, uh, technical issues with Zoom. Um, as, as Sean highlighted, essentially there are 12 principal modifiable risk factors that account for about 40% of dementias worldwide. I've illustrated some of them here on this slide, and I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail um, about risk factor management and modification over, over the life course. Um, when we do talk about a life course approach to, to brain health and to dementia prevention, and essentially what we're getting at with that is that it's never too early and never too late to think about reducing one's dementia risk. There are very effective interventions and measures that we can all take uh, to minimize our risk of developing dementia, and these do begin early in life. So the, the biggest factor in early life is something that we actually probably have little control of in many cases ourselves, and that's education. Um, so research would suggest that higher childhood education levels and indeed lifelong educational attainment are associated with a reduced risk of developing dementia in later life. Recent research would seem to um, indicate that the beneficial impacts of education are probably greatest in early life, peaking in adolescence with maybe fewer gains to be made, made after the age of, uh, of 20 or so. Um, something along similar lines um, that we're very frequently asked about is the concept of cognitive stimulation or brain training. Um, and the evidence for cognitive stimulation is not limited to early life. So these are two of the more evidence-based apps that are readily available uh, for computerized cognitive stimulation. We, when we look at people with normal cognition, the evidence would seem to suggest that computerized brain training uh, can improve the specific domain that you're training. So if you're using an app working on your short-term memory or your attention, it may well improve that, but it probably isn't going to improve your overall cognitive ability. Um, the evidence in people with mild memory impairment might be a little bit stronger. Um, so in people with mild cognitive impairment, computerized cognitive training has been demonstrated to, uh, to, in some cases, improve activity of daily living performance and can improve global cognitive ability. But again, it's an area of, of ongoing research. When we move on to, to midlife, something that some people are quite surprised to hear, hearing loss is actually a very significant factor. So we know that even subtle levels of hearing impairment in midlife do increase one's risk of developing a dementia in later life. 
Uh, for every 10 decibel reduction in hearing, we'll see a reduction in cognition. And to give some context, a whisper is, is only 25 decibels. So there really are very subtle levels of hearing impairment that can impact one's future dementia risk. The good news is that hearing aids are protective. So we know that people with memory impairments who wear hearing aids will decline less than those who don't. And indeed, people with normal cognition who wear hearing aids will decline more slowly than those who don't wear them. A very significant factor is high blood pressure. So again, hypertension in midlife is a significant risk factor for the development of dementia in one's later life. Um, again, a very, very treatable condition. So we have strong evidence uh, that demonstrates that treating high blood pressure in people with normal cognition in midlife will significantly reduce their dementia risk in later life. In the clinic, as Josh is going to discuss in a little while, we take a very individualized approach to blood pressure management, depending on other comorbidities that, that people might have. But the strongest evidence does support pretty aggressive intervention, so aiming for a blood pressure of less than 120 over 80. Alcohol can be a significant factor. And again, heavy drinking is associated with an increased risk of dementia as one ages. Um, and when I say heavy drinking, I'm saying kind of consuming greater than 21 units a week. The low risk Irish guidelines would say that uh, females can drink up to 11, 11 units a week and males up to 17, but certainly levels beyond 21 units, you are increasing your risk of dementia. Obesity, again, unfortunately, another very prevalent factor. So almost a quarter of the Irish population are obese. That's to say have a body mass index of greater than 30. Um, again, we know that obesity is a significant risk factor for the development of dementia. Uh, studies would show that the evidence for weight reduction in people with even normal cognition is quite striking in terms of the impact that it can have on your cognitive function. Uh, so losing anything greater than two kilograms can significantly improve your, uh, your attention and your short-term memory. And you can see benefits as soon as eight weeks after weight loss commences. Uh, to skip on to later life, so over the age of 65, something that's closely interrelated to obesity is the topic of physical inactivity. Uh, guidelines from the WHO and their risk reduction of cognitive decline and dementia, uh, guidelines which are excellent and very detailed, they'd suggest that people over the age of 65 should be getting about uh, 150 minutes or more of moderate intensity exercise each week. When we say moderate intensity exercise, unfortunately, we don't just mean a gentle stroll. It should be effortful. Do you know, you should be at the point where you're a little bit out of breath. In fact, that probably is what you're aiming for. So 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or indeed uh, 75 minutes or more of vigorous exercise. And it should be in blocks of at least 10 minutes at a time. Social isolation, something that's particularly topical in the context of the current pandemic. Um, Multiple studies across different cultures and continents have demonstrated the protective effect of social contact in reducing one's risk of dementia. A big study from the UK looked at over 10,000 people with very prolonged follow-up showed that people over the age of 60 who had frequent social contact were at lower risk of developing dementia than those who were socially isolated. Social isolation can feed into broader issues with mental health and indeed it can, can be connected to depression, which in its own right is a risk factor for the development of dementia. Air pollution, again, is prevalent and is associated with lots of adverse health outcomes. There's increasing attention on the potential effects of air pollution on the brain. Um, studies from the Matter Hospital and Beaumont um, last year with the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland showed that short-term air pollution exposure in Dublin was actually associated with increased risk of stroke. Um, there is burgeoning evidence to suggest that air pollution will actually increase one's dementia, dementia risk in, in later life. So we're talking about increased exposure to air pollution from exhaust fumes or indeed residential wood burning. The um, impact of smoking can be considerable um, and it probably does impact uh, the brain in similar ways to air pollution. Um, we do know that smoking in later life does increase one's dementia risk. Indeed, smoking throughout life is a risk factor for dementia. The good news is that it's never too late to stop. It's never too late to quit smoking. We have seen people over the age of 60 who stop smoking, uh, four years or more of stopping will significantly reduce your dementia risk over the following decade compared to people who uh, continue to smoke. 
uh, quit.ie, the HSE website is actually excellent. There's lots of resources there um, and, and very good supports if people are thinking of quitting. The final factor I touch on, something that Sean alluded to, uh, is diabetes. So we do know type 2 diabetes is a risk factor for the development of, of dementia. But really, it's the duration and severity of illness. Um, so I think just highlighting the necessity to, to be engaged in one's healthcare and to be on top of one's sugars if one does have a diagnosis of diabetes. Um, that's a, a very quick whistle-stop tour of some of the modifiable risk factors for dementia and some of the interventions that we can all take. Um, I think it's all very well talking about it hypothetically, but I suppose the question is, how do we put this into practice? How do we operationalize it in our clinic environment? So I might actually hand over to Joshi um, to, uh, to speak a little bit about that. Thanks very much. So there seems to be some interference there. I think Hi. you oh, Hi. Yeah. that's okay now, Joshi. Yeah. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah, can hear you, Joshi. Okay, that's good. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, can you see that? Yep. 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 So hi everyone. Uh, my name is Joshi, and like Tim said, um, we and like Sean said, we all work together in the Brain Health Clinic in Tala Hospital over here. So I work with Kathy, who's the other candidate ANP. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the background um, of the Brain Health Clinic. And I'm going to discuss a case study as well that um, of somebody who presented to the clinic over here. So just a little bit of background. So anybody who is seen in the Brain Health Clinic, they would have gone through the assessment process. They would have had a diagnosis. And we would see anybody who has a mild cognitive impairment, so that's an MCI, a vascular cognitive impairment, or a subjective memory complaints. And I know Sean talked a little bit about, um, you know, mild cognitive impairment and a dementia and the difference between them. The difference is just a loss of function. And uh, normally when somebody comes to the brain health clinic, it takes approximately 30 to 45 minutes for the dementia prevention advice. Again, that's dependent on the, on the person. Um, you know, and how much information they can take. And normally people are reviewed back in, you know, in the memory assessment clinic by myself and Kathy within one or two years, or just to see progression and to see how people are getting on. So, um, and just a, a little bit about the case study then. Um, William is a pseudonym of somebody. Uh, he's 72 years old, educated till 15 years old, worked in a sales, it worked as a salesman and retail manager, and he also did a deg degree in his late 40s. And I know education is one of the modifiable factors, but William actually did a degree in his late 40s, lives at home with his wife, uh, previous history, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and he's an ex-smoker of 18, uh, 18 years medication. Just the amlodipine. Amlodipine, for those of you who don't know, it's a calcium channel blocker. It's used to correct high blood pressure. So William was only on uh, amlodipine. And when William first came into the clinic, he was referred by his GP and he came with a symptom onset of over two years, which were progressively getting worse and worse. And um, the things that William actually presented to clinic with were issues with his attention so these were leaving tasks midway so he would be peeling potatoes and then move on to something so not finishing the original task again another example would be uh, not being able to retain so he would be watching the news but not being able to retain what you know what the news presenter uh, would be talking about amnestic symptoms so what i mean by amnestic symptoms is the forgetfulness uh, symptoms so these in William's case were 
uh, decreased short-term memory. So he had very poor short-term memory, really good long-term memory, could remember a lot of you know, things in his life, working, marriage, but very poor short-term uh, uh, recall, uh, forgetting recent conversations as well, and missing a few appointments um, if, with friends, um, might be a little bit disoriented. So mixing up days and dates, uh, forgetting names of his close friends, which he would have known before. So just those little things is uh, what William came, with, came, came in with. And uh, functional ability preserved. So what, what I mean by that is um, his day-to-day -day ability to do things. So his day-to-day -day ability to drive, to make breakfast, to dress himself, they were all fine. They were not impacted by the uh, issues that William presented with. And this is a big thing in dementia. In dementia, your function is affected. Um, well, in a mild cognitive impairment, it's normally not. And uh, some of the assessments and investigations that we did, I've only put two of the assessments that we did, you know, that I did over here. Um, these SMMSE, for those of you who don't know, it's an standardized mini mental exam. It's a very quick, brief um, thing that we do, a questionnaire, just a little bit about memory, about attention, uh, orientation. And William scored 25 out of 30. And the higher your score, the better. The exit 25, so that's the second one over here, uh, he's got nine out of 50. So the exit 25 looks at your executive function. And again, important thing to, to understand uh, in a dementia or even in a cognitive impairment, it's your working memory and your ability to plan and judgment. So the exit 25 looks at all of that. Um, and the less you score on the exit 25, the better. And William got nine out of 50. A score of 15 or more would be impaired uh, executive function. Um, William also had a brain scan. And uh, if with a lot of technical terms there, basically means uh, on the brain scan, we saw that the memory center was affected. So there was loss of tissue in the memory center. So that's your hippocampal area, like Sean was saying earlier on, uh, in your medial temporal lobe. So that's where your hippocampus and your amygdala is. So he had a lot of loss of tissue there. And some mild vascular burden as well uh, on the brain was visible. William was offered the lumbar puncture, which he had done, and that came back positive for Alzheimer's uh, proteins. And again, that's what Sean was referring to earlier on about the uh, biomarkers, the Alzheimer's biomarkers. And William's case, his ratio was elevated. So there's a ratio we work out and that was uh, elevated. And uh, he was, he had Alzheimer's protein. So the diagnosis then uh, for William is a mild cognitive impairment and he had positive Alzheimer's biomarkers. So where, where do we go from there after this diagnosis? What can William actually do to uh, reduce his progression uh, to dementia. So we devised a personalized prevention plan for William and he was followed up after the diagnosis disclosure. He was followed up in the brain health clinic about seven weeks uh, after his diagnosis. And, you know, we, we kind of work with the Lancet Commission. So everything, you know, the modifiable factors that were there. And we just worked through that with uh, with William. And the, I've just put a few things that uh, that we worked through. And just in terms of safety netting and kind of repeating assessment, uh, William was scheduled for a follow up then for a repeat assessment in one year's time, just to see how he how he's getting on. So just a little bit about the vascular risk um, in terms of Williams. He's so the assessment part. So he had diet control type two diabetes. If you've noticed on his medication, he was only on something for his blood pressure, so not taking any oral hypoglycemic, so no tablets for his blood pressure. He was on diet control. Um, he didn't check his blood sugar at home. Um, his blood pressure was checked by the GP every time that he would have gone to the GP, which wasn't that often. He's an ex-smoker of 18 years, I said, and his BMI, so that looks at your weight and your height, and William's BMI was 30 kilos per meter squared. And that falls into the obese uh, category. If you look at healthy island, 
um, you'll see that it looks it falls into the obese category. The normal BMI should be between 18.5 and 24.9 kilos per meter squared. So what what did I what did I do? What did we do in clinic? So check his vital signs again. Check his bloods. His blood pressure was slightly elevated at 148 over 78. The blood glucose fingerprint. So for those of you who've had it done, it's just the one that you um, get pricked here. It was 7.3 again, slightly elevated. In terms of bloods, the HbA1c looks at um, the sugar, the amount of glucose in in the blood. Uh, over a certain uh, amount of months and that was 47 again slightly elevated should be less you know it should be 42 or less and um, so I lies with the GP in terms of his blood results and to be referred for a blood pressure monitor it's not that things were horribly bad but they're not you know they were not manageable uh, if you look at some of the values. I've also explained to Williams the importance of managing his vascular risk in context of, you know, getting good brain health. Uh, the outcome then, so William now checks his blood sugar daily. Um, he is he was awaiting a blood pressure monitor and depending on the results of that we can you know there might be changes to his medication done so it might just increase the uh, amlodipine a little bit more and the aim is to reduce his bmi in terms of the diabetes i'll discuss this in uh, the next two slides uh, what what we actually uh, did for that um you know to control the bmi talking about insulin sensitivity um so exercise then um Again, the assessment, William loved walking. He was walking for about 20 minutes. It's a leisurely walk. He was not involved in any group activities. And normal gait, I've put normal gait there because I think it's very important, especially if, if somebody has um, arthritis or if you have pain, that's going to affect your ability to do some exercise. So, but William was actually okay and he had normal gait. Um, he was walking fine. So in terms of action then, I just discussed the need for exercise and physical activity with William. And like Tim would have said earlier on about how much exercise or physical activity we need to do. So a total of 150 minutes per week or 30 minutes, uh, five days a week and moderate. So you should be you know, a bit out of breath when you're doing it, not leisurely walk, for example. I also referred uh, William to the XWELL, so that's the community exercise program we have here in Tala um, and the walking group. So we have a list of all the walking groups, again, in the Tala Pondalkin, you know, in our kind of catchment area, which I gave to William. The outcome then, William um, accepted to attend the XWELL and he attends this twice weekly. You'll see I've put in kind of uh, in brackets there about City West Hotel. So that's just during the pandemic now. It used to be in the Fortune Stan Leisure Center, but this is where they're being done now. Um, online resource, which I think is very important, especially in terms of, you know, COVID and doing some exercises uh, at home. Uh, Ciel Bleu has some online classes. And uh, on YouTube, you have the Tower University Hospital classes, Jerry's Gym for older person. So I just uh, showed it to William. You know, it's something that you can work through uh, at home as well. And he he joined a, a local walking group, um, which is not going ahead at the moment, but he, he joined it. In terms of diet then, um, he was not compliant with his diabetic diet and he was unaware of the brain uh, promotion diet. We also looked at the Mediterranean diet in terms of brain health. Um, and his Mediterranean diet score was five out of 14. So the higher your score, the better. Uh, alcohol intake was not an issue and BMI, I said, I talked about. So just what we did, so explain the benefits of the Mediterranean diet and diabetic diet, especially in William's case, just uh, alcohol was not an issue. However, I re-emphasize not to start taking, you know, increased alcohol and just looking at the bloods again, the HbA1c or cholesterol. And we live with the GP. And in terms of the diabetes, then we actually linked William with the diabetic clinic. We didn't start any medication. Um, we said we'll see the, how he goes with the diet first and linked him up with the diabetic clinic. And in terms of sensory, again, that's the hearing impairment and vision. Um, 
William denied any hear hearing impairment, didn't have any hearing assessment before, but the wife was telling me that he was unable to hear some of the phone conversation. Um, so what we did was I explained the link between cognition and hearing loss and uh, the need for maximum sensory function just to you know promote your information intake and it can her hearing loss can have debilitating consequences as well on your function social and well-being you know it can lead to loneliness and frustrations um and we have a, an audiology pathway here in Tower University Hospital between the memory service and the audiology department. So I just sent William for that to get his hearing checked and he booked himself in for, a, for an eye test. So hearing assessment just showed a sensorineural hearing impairment, likely from, you know, from age on both sides. And he was referred to have hearing aids and um, I just advised him on getting regular vision and hearing uh, sleep, there was no REM sleep behavior disorder, so kind of kicking in your sleep or restless leg, there was nothing like that. I used the Pittsburgh sleep questionnaire and he scored five. Um, there's also the Mayo sleep questionnaire that I could have used, but I used this one. Um, per William's wife, she said that he was gasping for air sometimes and very loud snoring. And we just discussed some tips on sleep hygiene about, you know, good bedtime routine, getting the light during the day in your circadian rhythm. And I referred him on externally to PMAD, the sleep studies uh, clinic of PMAD. And he was uh, just diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, which might explain some of the inattention, uh, the inattention symptoms as well. And he's been followed up over there and to command CPAP as well, which is a machine to help uh, help you breathe and the reason this is important is decrease oxygen saturation during the sleep which can kill off some of the brain cells um stimulating and cognitive abilities again tim touched briefly on this about uh, the need to engage in activities now william was not involved in any groups previously tried the men's shed didn't like it uh, he was still able to use the ipad and browse the internet so I referred him on to CL Blue again online and cognitive stimulating activities. The Brain HQ, for those of you who don't know, it's a very good one. Or Cogni, Cognifit is another another good um, place where you can do some stimulating uh, activities for the brain. And uh, he speaks with his family regularly and he picked up the Brain HQ and card games on his iPad. The CAS 19 over here, that's just a quality of life. Um, questionnaire that we would do and the higher you score the better it looks at control autonomy pleasure and all those things and mood uh, william didn't have any mood issues um his hospital anxiety and depression score was stable and the npiq over here that's the neuropsychiatric inventory that the family or you know a carer can complete and there was no reports at all but still i just uh, educated uh, william on how to Um, Joshi, your screen is frozen. Um, I'm not too sure if everybody else is having that problem. Maybe one of the yeah, panelists. No, could... um, yes, sir. I think the screen does look like it. I'd say their connection dropped. Yeah. Okay. So, and she was probably near the end anyway, I would guess. <laughs> so maybe will we move on to some questions and um, then if Joshi can come back. If we can get her back, we can finish off her presentation. Yeah, Perfect. that sounds okay. Okay, so I don't know if you saw any of the questions coming in, Sean, yourself. I, I uh, there was a few coming in, um, so uh, I, I saw them, but I don't know which which way do you want to prioritize some of them. I... Yeah. Okay. Um, so I can I think, start. Uh, reading. Joshi's screen may have frozen. She was just at the end of her presentation. Yeah, I was just at the end of my presentation. Oh. There, sorry. And, That's all right. Um, after mood, we ju we just I just kind of tid tidied it up. So this is what we do normally in the brain health clinic, um, and I think we're going to take question um, now. Yeah. Yeah. So were you finished, Joshi? You got through everything, did you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Um, so. 
Yeah, so I can start reading out some questions if you like. Uh, I have them here. So one question was, what causes the protein buildup in the brain? So uh, there's two different causes of protein buildup, um, and I mentioned them earlier on. Uh, so for a small number of people who have some genes, and I saw there was a question in around Lewy body, and uh, a person who was inquiring about two of her siblings had Lewy body, and did that place her at increased risk? Well, we know that there's a very small proportion of dementia, probably in the region of 2 to 3%, which is due to um, a genetic... A, abnormality, which results in the overproduction of some of these proteins. And in that context, that's what leads to the accumulation in the brain. So there are, you know, about one to 2% of, of all cases of Alzheimer's disease, which are due to a genetic risk, which increases the production of beta amyloids, that protein that accumulates in that brain. It's far, it's, it's less common and less described in a, in, in Lewy body. Um, but in, in, so for some people, it's a genetic risk that, that leads to that increased protein production. For the vast majority of dementias, we call them sporadic. And what it is, is as we, as the brain gets older, the brain has this protective barrier around it called the blood brain barrier, which, which actually protects toxins from getting into the brain. And as we get older, there's changes in that blood brain barrier, which probably prevent the removal of some of these proteins, which are probably being produced on an ongoing basis um, within the brain as it ages, but have you know, very effective mechanisms of clearing these proteins. And as a result of those clearance mechanisms don't work as well, the proteins accumulate in the brain as we get older. And that's why age is such a risk factor. Okay, great. Um, there's a question, if you spot memory changes and cognitive alterations, which are not really impacting functioning yet, do you put up with it and ignore it? Is it not better to do something early? It is definitely better to do something early. And, and I think, you know, what, we're, what we always talk about is a timely diagnosis as opposed to talking in terms of early or late. Um, a timely diagnosis is at the stage that somebody maybe notices that their memory isn't as good. One of the things I would say is, is we're very poor, you know, at, at making a judgment of our own memory performance. Um, you know, a common phrase that Tim and Joshua will have heard me regularly say in the clinic is you can't remember what you've forgotten. So oftentimes it's people around you who will notice whether or not there's a difficulty with your memory. Us as individuals are often not very good uh, barometers of, of our memory pro uh, performance. Sometimes, you know, people will have had a very high level and will be very, con you know, will have, you know, concerns over and above, possibly as we know. And we know that there is an age-related cognitive decline. And by age-related cognitive decline, is the brain is like any other muscle. And as we get a little bit older, we've less demands or different demands on our memory from when we, when well, what we had when we were working. We possibly don't need the short-term memory, if you like, you know, file pad for all of those activities that we need to have ongoing during a day. So. You know, it changes as we get older. There are some kind of reductions in our memory, you know, ability as we get older. But anybody who has a concern about recurring memory difficulties, and in particular if they're interfering with their ability to do their day-to-day -day tasks, they definitely should be, you know, should go to have them looked into. It's much better to get a baseline as well. So to go to your GP, to get a baseline where you have a discussion with your GP about the memory things, he can look at things like your vascular risk factor. So it's a good prompt to go and take advice about blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, know your numbers is what we would always say. And that's what my cardiology colleagues would always say. And then on the basis of that, your GP will advise as to whether or not it's appropriate to go and have further investigations in, in a memory service such as our own. They'll be very, they'll, they'll have a good barometer and they'll have a good intuition themselves as to whether it needs to be looked into further. Okay, great. Uh, question on proteins in the brain. Have you any comments on the studies examining the presence of bacteria associated with gum disease in the brains of those with dementia? Yeah, oh, so a very a very interesting question so one of the there, there is we're, we're still at the stage of understanding a huge amount around what is responsible for initiating a lot of these a, a lot of these uh if you like neurodegenerative if you like a lot of them are cascade events so in other words there's a small event that starts the second event that starts the third event that starts the fourth event within the brain so it's not a straightforward one hit that happens it's often it's it's a sequence of events uh one of the uh, theories as to what might start some of these cascades is infections both oral infections so some oral mucosal infections but other also infections 
elsewhere in the body, which can cause an increase, a chronic increase in, in inflammatory markers in the brain. And I suppose with COVID, we've all become, you know, armchair immunologists, and we know a little bit more about what, what inflammatory markers are, are in the brain. But, but ultimately, these are proteins that are released in response, sometimes to very low grade infections. And the chronic accumulation of those proteins can sometimes trigger the abnormal proteins that we see accumulate with Alzheimer's disease or with other degenerative conditions. So there is some link between, if you like, even oral, uh, oral mouth infections, dental infections and, and dementia, but it is an area, I suppose, of it's, it's an area of research rather than a definitive uh, risk, as I say, and should be entirely treatable. And yet again, I think a lot of it is, is people who maintain good oral health often will, will maintain their other aspects of their health care quite well. So you can always get these epi phenomenon whereby somebody who isn't maintaining good oral health maybe aren't also maintaining good check on their blood pressure or their cholesterol. Or so you get these epi phenomenons of groups of people that you can that you can co-locate. So you know, I think it's still more to be discovered, but it, it is an interesting question. Mm. Okay, great. Um, in terms of hearing loss, so obviously that was mentioned as one of the risk factors um, from that Lancet report. Um, somebody's asked, how do you think hearing loss affects dementia? Tim, do you want to do you want to take that one? It, so I, I think it's probably something that isn't quite clearly defined yet, Carol. It likely relates, or there's thoughts that it may relate to just the impact of, of hearing loss on cognitive stimulation. So your, your brain isn't getting stimulated. Uh, you're not getting the same kind of afferent input. Um, there are studies suggesting that people with hearing impairment and dementia, um, it, that it may actually impact memory specific areas, that there may be atrophy of particular memory areas in the brain in people with hearing impairment. But as I say, it's something that's being, that's being teased out in ongoing work. Mm, okay. I agree. And, and I think there's also, it's hearing also involves comprehension. So understanding what it is we're hearing. So some of the perception of hearing loss, as Tim was, is actually, it's, it's that the words may be getting in, but the comprehension that puts them together, that part of the brain that puts together the words and locks it away as, a, as an entity. Is, 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 is probably, and it could be a very subtle, so certainly speech, hearing, and how we walk could be very subtle early signs that there's an issue within the brain. And I think that's what's coming true when we look at it in midlife, um, where it seems, and, and it's, it, you know, within this context, it is one of our greatest risks. Uh, and, and I suppose the fact that we have hearing aids and we have something that can modify it, it is such an important message to get out that people who have a perception. And yet again, we're very bad at making a self judgment on our hearing or our visual abilities because our brain adjusts to it. So it is important to get our eyes and our ears checked on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because actually another question was, does sight loss also impact? So again, the, the sensory, you know, hearing and sight, important to get that checked as well, you're saying? Yeah, vi and vision is probably, we have, as, as an organism, as, as humans, our brain is very much a visual brain. It's one of those things that distinguishes us from an awful lot of our, you know, other animals. And vision is the only sense that has a whole lobe of the brain dedicated to it. So most of our memory processes, or a huge number of our memory processes, a huge amount of our thought processes and movement processes have a huge input from visual and visual memory. So even our ability to plan and strategize stuff relies on visual information. So vision is very, very important. Uh, and then from the point of view of eyesight, feeding into that it's it's just important that all the receptacles your ear your ears and your eyes are very well uh, attuned to take in the bit it's like turning up the volume you just gotta you have to have the volume optimized to be able to take in all the information yeah and the question can tinnitus be a factor for dementia so again relating i suppose to hearing loss or uh, hearing damage yeah, no, I, I mean, certainly with, with, it's the same as the risk for hearing loss. Um, and, and certainly uh, there are some treatments coming true for tinnitus, which look like they may have a potential benefit effect. So uh, certain nerve stimulation uh, treatments that are treatments for tinnitus. Uh, and Tim and Mio you know, would, would, you know, this would have been one of those areas that Tim would have uh, looked at from a research perspective before. So we, we do know that there is an association between tinnitus and areas of the brain that are responsible for memory uh, and some of those treatments, some of those non-invasive nerve stimulation treatments uh, that people are looking at as potential treatments for, for, for tinnitus may also have, have benefits from the point of view of, of, of memory. 
Great. Um, so there is a question about type one diabetes. Is that a risk factor? So I don't know, Josh, do you want to talk about? Uh, no, we, we were talking about uh, type two diabetes, which is which what you which is what you would normally get in your midlife. Type one diabetes would normally happen in uh, younger people, but of course, you know, if you don't control your, uh, if you don't have good glycemic control, of course, it's going to affect uh, the brain. And there's different studies, you know, that shows uh, not just type two diabetes, but even you know type. A type one. So it's very good to get, you know, good glycemic control. And by good glycemic control, I mean, you know, your finger, your blood glucose finger prick test to get it down within the normal range. And same with your HbA1c as well, uh, which is the blood test that you, you would, that we would do over here uh, to get it within normal range. Um, and, and I think in, in uh, exactly all of that, Josh, and I think in type 1 diabetes as well as the hypoglycemias. Mm -hmm. So people are often on insulin therapy and their sugar levels can go quite low. Our brain uses up over 20% of all of our sugar, you know, if you like all of that energy reserve in the brain. And often our brain scans that we would look at looks specifically at glucose activity in the brain. So hypoglycemic, low sugar levels. So whereas in type 2 diabetes, I suppose that often the danger is is in high sugars. In, in type 1 diabetes, as well as the high sugars and that, you know, difficulty controlling it sometimes, it's also low sugar levels where people are on therapies that can cause their sugars to go low. Whereas most type 2 diabetes therapies won't, uh, won't cause sugars to go low. Okay. Um, so question about proteins. If proteins can be identified 15 to 25 years in advance of diagnosis, how can you get tested? So, so there's different ways of testing for proteins. So it's got to be said that these Alzheimer's disease is really the only condition, memory condition, whereby the our level of understanding these protein biomarkers is such that we could use them in a clinical environment. The other conditions such as Lewy body and frontotemporal dementia, you know, those proteins and how we interpret those biomarkers are really very much more at a research level. Um, so from the point of view of looking at it for Alzheimer's disease is a lumbar puncture, which is, you know, something that we would do several times a week in our own memory service where we numb the lower back and we take a sample of fluid from the lower back. And that's fluid that circulates around the brain and we measure those protein levels in that fluid. It's a very minor procedure and it takes about an hour in total and the person goes off home afterwards with very, you know, very few, uh, very few issues. Um, there is a, other imaging scans that are evolving um, called uh, PET scans, which are, you know, uh, specialist CT scans, which we have a radio, a radio tracer label that sticks to the protein in the brains. And they'll be, you know, they'll be starting in Ireland from about April, but at the moment it's, it's kind of, it's difficult to see exactly how, you know, where they're gonna fit in and they will likely be very expensive when they are available. Okay, great. Um, is there any conclusive evidence that people with CVA, so cerebrovascular accident, will progress to develop vascular dementia with any degree of certainty? Okay. So, it, it really depends on the area of the brain that's had a stroke. Um, so there are strategic areas of the brain, such as the temporal lobe and those memory centers that, that Joshi was talking about. And also in our base, you know, in, in, in other parts of the brain, you know, called our, our, our thalamus and our basic language, where a lot of the information, if you like, pathways either pass through or our storage areas. Or if we have a stroke in our frontal lobe, which is our, you know, a, a lobe that's often re responsible for how our judgment and our thinking. So if we have strokes in certain areas, there's a greater risk of us having a memory difficulty. It isn't an inevitability by any manner of means. Um, and often what happens following a stroke, and this can happen for, you know, there's an early recovery phase after a stroke, and then there is a, a slower, more gradual recovery phase that happens after a stroke. And recovery and rewiring of the brain, that's why the analogy of a fuse board is a little bit accurate, because damaged areas of the brains, you know, the, the air, often, you know, areas co-located beside it often take up the workload. Uh, there's a rewiring that happens over months afterwards, and that's how recovery from stroke happens. So oftentimes the brain will recover. I suppose there is, there is a vulnerability that probably is there following a stroke. So if you do develop these proteins and you have had a stroke, there's probably a greater risk that you might have an earlier clinical expression of symptoms 
by virtue of the fact that you've had it. But the, it isn't an inevitable um, a consequence of having a stroke that you will have memory impairment. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm just looking at the time here. We've just gone over 12 o'clock, so, and we actually have a lot more questions. So what we might do is um, stop there. And I know we're planning a separate webinar because I, I thought we might you know, end up with more questions than we'd have time to answer. And certainly from the, the next few webinars we're going to be running, we'll probably get more questions as well. So um, what we're planning on doing is running um, a wrap up webinar in May uh, to address some of these questions. So what we can do is collate some of them together and you know, have a, a general panel discussion, maybe have about an hour, a bit more time to, to address all these, these interesting questions. So apologies that we can't answer everybody's. Uh, hopefully you found that uh, very useful today. I know there's a lot of you logged on, so it's obviously a, a topic that's of interest to people. Um, so uh, our next webinar is next Monday. Um, and it's going to be on nutrition and the aging brain. At the moment, it's actually sold out, but I'm going to try and increase uh, the number of tickets available from 500 to 1,000. So we have 500 people registered for that. So I'm gonna see if we can um, increase our license on Zoom for that. So hopefully people won't be disappointed and you'll be able to log on to that. So I'd just like to thank um, Professor Sean Kennelly, Dr. Tim Duclo, and Joshi Dukey for the, the talks today. They were very interesting. And thanks as well to Sinead Grennan, who helped out in the background on the logistics. And thanks everybody for logging in today. And um, as I said earlier, the webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. So if you look up Dementia Research Network Ireland on YouTube, um, I'll try and send you all a link anyway, uh, once, it's, once it's ready. Um, but just in case you don't get that for any reason, it'll be, it'll be there uh, during the week. Okay, so thanks and have a good day. Thank you.